Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Ann Zink. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the State of Alaska, as mentioned. Uh, I got asked to do this job, um, but just a perfect timing, six months prior to the pandemic uh, starting. Um, I actually had come up to Alaska, as mentioned previously, as a mountaineering guide and had fallen in love with the state uh, and also fell in love with a person. And so after residency, he said, I've done three years of residency for you. Can we please move back to Alaska? I'd really love to be up there. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. I'm really interested in academics. I'm really interested in system change. Um, but okay, we'll go for a couple years and we'll see what that's like. And really within six months of working uh, up in Palmer, Alaska, really fell in love with the medicine up here as well as the people in the place and knew that this was home for us. Um, and so quickly became the medical director of our group and just was thought I would you know, live my career here, seeing patients in the emergency department. But I quickly realized that in the emergency department, it's where you saw all policy fail and where you saw systems fail. And it's one thing to see a patient once or twice or three times with the same problem and seeing the systems continue to fail patients. But after a while, you realize that you can't continue to do that practice if you don't figure out how to make the system better as a whole. So I started to ask a lot of questions, asked too many questions until I ended up in too many meetings, until I ended up in this job. So uh, you know, uh, careful on how many questions you end up asking. Um, but it, I got to know Dr. Jay Butler, who was my predecessor, um, and spent a lot of time within the state, working throughout the state. I uh, spent a lot of time working on trauma, I actually spent a lot of time working with Fairbanks Memorial Hospital thinking about trauma patients across the state and how do we coordinate and collaborate, really what does the data show and how can we make sure that we're having the best outcomes possible. I had a case early in residency where a patient had come in, he was uh, 18 years old and uh, he actually got stabbed in the chest, it was about five minutes before shift change, it was right at the end of my shift um, and I was supposed to go off uh, really at 7 a.m. The trauma surgeon had left uh, for the night because they're like, oh, the next trauma surgeon will be coming in here shortly. And so it was us in the emergency department. Uh, he came in, uh, and as soon as he kind of landed at the hospital, the kid lost vitals. So blood pressure went away, no heartbeat essentially had, had died at that time. You know, we've been trained as emergency medicine physicians that if that happens and it's a penetrating trauma, there's kind of a Hail Mary uh, thing that you can try where you actually cut open their chest and you see if you can figure out where the cause of the bleeding is and to see if you can stop it. And it's somewhere between a one to 5% chance of survival if you try this, but the person's dead. And so it's worth trying because the outcomes at that point, you know, are you're choosing between a really bad outcome or a pretty bad outcome. And so we made the decision to open his chest and found that his heart had been stabbed uh, on that left side, opened up, removed the blood around it, uh, hole in his heart, put her finger in there turned on the blood pressure cuff and the blood and turned on the blood transfuser that we had and his heart just went from flat to filled up and then started to beat. And it was just then beating with our finger <laughs> sitting there in his heart. Uh, we're like, well, check the blood pressure and he had a good blood pressure. And so now he's alive. So he was dead and then he was alive. And uh, fortunately, the cardiothoracic surgeon was rounding upstairs and he got wind of what was happening in the department and came down and said, you need help? And we're like, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> totally use a hand right now because <laughs> he's doing well, but we're not. It's so a long story short, and the reason I tell this story is because the kid ended up doing really well. He was discharged from the hospital a week later, completely neurovascularly intact, no outcome, like poor outcome, you know, completely maintaining well, all his you know, kidneys, liver, heart, everything were working really well. But afterwards, there was a lot of criticism. Well, why did you not do this first? And why did you do this? And how about this procedure? And how about that? And why wasn't the trauma surgeon there? And there was a lot of whys and whiffs. And these cases don't happen very often, so it's good to review. And I was upset by all the whys and the ifs. And like, you know, I thought we were here for the patient. I didn't think we were here for the system. And I had a really wise attending say to me once. He said, Ann, you always have to do what's right for the patient and remember that the rest is noise. And what you guys did was right for the patient. And it's good to review these systems, but remember that there can be a lot of noise in medicine. And you have to really funnel that out. And when you're taking care of a patient, focus on it. And the reason I bring up that story is because it's been one of the kind of guiding principles for me as a clinician and thinking about what we can do for patients and how can we remember that the rest is noise. And so I put that as context for what I'm going to talk about today in Alaska's health scorecard because I really want to put at the very heart of what we're doing is the patients and the people that we serve um, within the hospital, within our clinical care, and within the work that we're doing every single day. Um, because that's why we're here, uh, and it's for the health and well-being of each and every person. So um, that's why I kind of start with that little bit longer story in that space. We are now the Department of Health. So we did split between the Department of Health and Social Services to the Department of Health this just July. So our logo, uh, Commissioner Crum, uh, <laughs> don't ask him about his uh, Homer essay on dog sleds. He has a lot of feelings about dog sleds. Uh, but he uh, chose this partially because he felt like 
it really represented what he was hoping the Department of Health would be, and that would be people collectively working together for a shared mission of really serving people. And really the fact that Alaska does have really unique ways of delivering healthcare, really reflecting back on the public health nurses who have worked across the state, along much of our, you know, as mentioned, our ancestral home, uh, and mentioning you know, the Alaska Native influence uh, and, and just that respect and that history that is carried through so much of our work uh, today. So that's, that's the reason for our new logo, um, which I have appreciated. And this is a slide that I use uh, oftentimes in these presentations because I think that this can become really complex and it can become really overwhelming. And you can think about all these different parts of what does make someone healthy, what is a healthy system, what is a ho healthy hospital, what's a healthy health insurance, what is the best type of health insurance? I mean, we can get into all of these questions forever uh, and we can get into circles about them. And there's no magic answer, I will tell you that. And I also really spent, I know, bummer, right? <laughs> like, if you just do this, it will all work out fine. And I've also come to believe that everyone's always going to be unhappy with healthcare. And that's because healthcare has to deal with when you're sick and you're ill and you're hurt, and no one wants to be that. And so I think we also have to recognize it has to deal with when things aren't going well. And so oftentimes the system doesn't necessarily feel like it's going well, even if it's going the best it is. And I've had to come to terms with that. It took me a while to come to terms with that over time. But there's these different pieces, the mental health, the physical health, the economics, the social connections, access to healthcare, cost of care, all make a difference in what happens for that patient. And again, who is that person underneath there? In the emergency department, I think about this all the time. You know, someone is, uh, we were joking about this earlier when I was at Fairbanks Memorial, I sometimes think I have a very HIPAA compliant mind. Like, they're bed seven with a potassium of 6.2, and they're a 35 year old, and here's the chief complaint without their name and these other pieces. But their name and all these other pieces make up who they all are. And I get to see this tiny little sliver of who they are. But how can we make sure that we are building systems that serve the patient and not having patients and healthcare serving the systems? And so I always want to think about what is that person behind and how can we make sure that the frontline clinician can have access to their past medical history. They don't have to just say, I'm taking two white pills. I don't remember what they are. But you can actually find out what those two white pills are because then you can figure out what they actually need to go on in the other place that their mental health and physical health are combined as one. Uh, you know, I sometimes say that mental health and physical health are one in every way that we take care of healthcare, except for how we pay for it, where they're completely separate. And so what ways can we really think about the mind and body connected in that same sort of way, and how behind each of these stories is a patient? This graph I find uh, interesting, useful, and somewhat depressing, uh, kind of all at the same time. And so uh, it, they get more depressing, I'll just warn you uh, here. So, um, this looks at life expectancy over time. Um, and, you know, when I'm thinking about what is health, what is health care, I think we're thinking about what makes us healthy and well for as long as we possibly can be. That doesn't necessarily translate to years. Our wellness is a part of it. Quality of life is clearly a part of it. Um, but life expectancy is one tool that we use to kind of look at the overall health of a population. And then we also think about, like, how much do we pay for that and what does that look like over time? So this is life expectancy over time in the U.S. This is from the 1800s through 2019. And you can see that there's this big dip, and that's the 1918 pandemic uh, there, where you saw a real decrease in life expectancy. You see some bumps associated with some wars uh, in there. <laughs> um, and then you can see in general, you know, we've been having this increase in life expectancy. But you can see more recently, and this is all pre-COVID, you saw flattening. And then in the U.S., about five years ago, we started to see a decrease overall in life expectancy. So despite, this is all pre-COVID, despite spending more money on health care, Despite all the work that we've been doing, how far we've come, we're starting to see this decrease in life expectancy. And why is that? What are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? And how does that move forward? Atul Gawande, who's written a bunch of books, he's a surgeon, uh, he's now over USAD, you know, he talks a lot about that there were kind of three major kind of chunks within here. If you go back to the 1800s, a lot of that was understanding really basic infectious disease, kind of that deepest well, having clean water, clean sewer systems, and understanding that really made the biggest difference in life expectancy. And then what we saw with that kind of really steep increase there, kind of in the 1940s to 1960s, was really diagnostic medicine. Having a better understanding of a chest x-ray, antibiotics, basic vaccines, really made huge differences in basic diagnostic and therapeutic medicine during that time. And he would argue the reason we're starting to see a decrease in life expectancy in the US, again, outside of COVID, is because of our systems of care and the way that we put systems of care together. And so we're seeing greater and greater discrepancies between some people living much longer, some people really not getting some of those basic services and a bigger discrepancy, as well as thinking about the things outside of healthcare. So thinking about the social determinants of health, thinking about our healthy food, diet, living. About 80% of our overall health is made up from things outside of the healthcare system. 
how socially connected you are. What does your diet look like? What does your exercise look like? And what sort of tools and things are we putting into from the way that we design cities uh, to the ways that we're able to have access to food that then overall improve our health? And so he really argues that our systems of the way that we serve both healthcare and health within communities and the lack thereof has been really kind of the big game changer uh, in what we see with the decrease. And where that comes from is when you look at us compared to other countries. And so this again looks over time. This looks at your life expectancy and this looks at spending. And so you can see, you know, back uh, earlier, and so this uh, graph, I believe, begins in, the, I think it was 2000, yeah, 19, 1970 to 2015. So 1970 is when it's kind of all starts off with life expectancy and cost, and you can see over time. And you can see that most developing countries, you know, have been spending a little bit more on healthcare, but have really been getting huge gains in life expectancy. And you can see that the US is a bit of an outlier on here. You can see that we're spending a lot more per capita but we're not getting those same gains that you would expect in the same sort of way. So comparing us, and there's, there's cultural differences, there's structural differences, there's pluses and minuses, but again, this is just looking at cost and this is looking at life expectancy. Has anyone ever seen this slide before? No? <laughs> Have you memorized this slide before? I'm gonna quiz you all on this later and make sure that you all know this. This is not a meme. This was an actual slide that was put together during the Affordable Care Act. Uh, to be able to demonstrate how healthcare fits together within our country. Um, so I have presented this slide many times. I have looked at this slide many times. <laughs> There's a lot on this slide. Uh, and this doesn't include like all of the social determinants of health that I talked about. This has nothing to do with food, access to transportation, diet, exercise. This is just the system of how the federal government administers healthcare within our country. And again, that has nothing to do with states. And really, we have a lot of state authority within the way that our Constitution is set up. I think uh, some people saw more of that than others within kind of this most recent pandemic. Really, states have the authorities on how they said if they're going to expand Medicaid or not, how they're going to run and do insurance, how are they going to partner. I think there's this perception that this is all federally run, but actually a lot of this is really state determined. And we see huge outcome differences based on different states depending on how they structure their own health care. So this is just the federal component of it. This doesn't even overlie how this fits into states uh, and then other aspects like tribal health overall. So our system of healthcare, I would say, is a challenge. And then we get Alaska specifics on top of it. <laughs> so now we'll get into the fact that like, we live really far apart from each other. Uh, and then we have huge geographic barriers. You know, we were just on a meeting today uh, this afternoon with the chief medical officers from all the hospitals and we were kind of going through you know what's your challenge how are you doing and Uvyavik's like the fog has been really bad what can you help with that and I'm like I had no solution for that one but <laughs> let me know if you need more things for a longer period of time but like that's their big problem today for Uvyavik was like fog like what are we going to do about that versus staffing was for other people or not having availability to accept patients at Providence NICU was like what brought up kind of in that space and that component. So every place has a little bit different and our geography really is a challenge. But I would highlight the fact that we have a unique ability. I feel like our geography and our distance as well as our small population allows us to see problems in really unique and different ways. And I think allows us to be able to see through all of that noise like we had talked to you about before and to see that patient and to be able to see through some of the challenges and to move towards solutions that actually make sense. So I'll give you an example of something that I saw early on in my practice. When I trained in residency, if you had someone who had been in an injury and they had a small head bleed, some bleed on their brain, I was an automatic admission to the ICU. Period, end of discussion, it was like the easiest admission. You didn't really hope for it for the patient, but from a discharge perspective, it was always easy. <laughs> like you're like, that is where they go. Well, I came here and I was actually, at, you know, I was still working at Matsu Regional Emergency Department and I, I see Mark sneaking in the back here. He can testify as from an ER perspective. You know, uh, I would have a person with a small head bleed and they'd say, well, send that patient home. I'm like, wait, excuse me? Like, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, it's an automatic ICU admission. And so we spent a lot of time as a state to say, well, what does the data show? And who really needs ICU admission? Who doesn't need ICU admission? And really, it turns out that there is a small percentage of patients who really don't do badly. They do very well. And you probably should watch them, have some good caregiver who's nearby and can bring them in. And you know, they shouldn't be on blood thinners, they should be mentating well, there are kind of key components to it. But probably a lot more of these people can go home. But when you work in a big academic center where everything needs to be the same, it's just easier to admit the patient and move forward. And so Alaska has its own head trauma protocol on who stays in a local hospital, who goes home, and who gets sent, really based on the most recent data science and evidence. And now many states are copying us for that 
because it is really freeing up a lot of ICU beds, it's freeing up ICU, it's saving costs and money, and people are able to be home and sleep with their family rather than like sleeping in a really uncomfortable bed for 24 hours with no added benefit and adding just cost to the system. So that would be an example where I, early on in my career, saw our geography and our distance force us to think about problems differently that is helping the rest of the country think about problems in ways that really, again, really serve the patient, not just serving the system as a whole. And then how do you braid the different work that happens? You know, Medicaid and Medicare were really created as the funding source for the poor, the elderly, the indigent. And that was kind of this combination between public health and health care. Like, OK, we've got some people who really need access to health care, and this is going to be a mechanism to pay for it. But over time, what has happened is there's been this kind of real divergence between health care and public health. And you see it on both sides. You know, public health is like, I don't want to talk to those healthcare people over there. They're a for-profit machine that isn't thinking about the whole population, and I don't know what that is. And you talk to the healthcare, and they're like, I don't have time to be able to send all this data in on syndromic surveillance and all these other things. i got to care for my patient right here, right now, and i got 20 other patients waiting to see me. And so you've seen over time this really big divergence between public health and healthcare. But the reality is they're like the numerator and the denominator of the same equation. Or another way I like to think about it is like sitting on a train and they're both looking outside of the windows and one seeing the trees and one seeing the forest. And they're both there and they're both part of the story, but you can't see without and without the other. And understanding both the health of the forest and the individual tree help you to care for the whole thing. And so I think we really have to find ways to braid health care with public health moving forward. And I think this is a huge challenge in the state. I think it's a huge challenge nationally as well. And there's a lot more conversation as well as mechanisms to do this um, that are starting to pop up and I think really kind of going to be part of those tools for the next future on how do we bend that cost curve and increase life expectancy. So here you've got public health really implementing these innovations to the whole population. So, you know, safe roads to be able to drive on or access to healthy foods or smoking sensation programs versus you've got traditional health care, which is that individual use of evidence base, like how am I going to help this one person to stop smoking? But then really that bucket that we miss in the middle is providing services outside the clinical setting that are able to integrate both of those things together. And there's really kind of no payment mechanism for it, so that's why we don't see much of that in that space. And then how do you have those braid together so that the individual person is walking between this public health and healthcare sector without even realizing it? They are choosing healthy foods. They're able to you know, have exercise by the way that they're able to commute back and forth. They're able to see their primary. And maybe they have an app on their phone that's helping them to check like their diabetes at home. So being able to move those two directions. Did I just kill a mic? Yeah, it sounds like I just got really quiet. Wiggle the cord. Oh, there you go. OK. Kick it, wiggle the cord. It's all good. OK. That was like. <laughs> So this is what public health kind of really initially was. Public health used to be like, okay, the primary care will take care of the doc, and if someone doesn't have a primary, I will take care of that patient. I will hold that baby, I will give that immunization, I will do that direct care. Um, and I will do that direct care for people who don't have care. But again, with the access to Medicare and Medicaid, that started to provide direct care for those who didn't otherwise have access. And so public health has shifted over time to really this kind of model of public health 3.0. And that's much more thinking about the system. What is the community health needs assessment? What does this community need? What does Fairbanks need to be healthy? What does the data show on suicide, alcohol rates, cardiac disease, cancer rates? How and what do we think about the access and tools for that community? And so each community actually has a community needs assessment that the public health centers do, often in times in combination with the hospital to better lay out what does that community's health look like and how do we partner together to say what makes sense for this community. Because what looks right in Fairbanks and is going to work for Fairbanks is going to be really different than Utviadvik, which is going to be very different than Alaska, which is going to be very different than Anchorage. So using those community health. And this is a lot of the work that we're doing right now within public health, is really trying to help each of our centers transition into this public health 3.0, where they can be this convening factor and they can be using data to help to align the different groups to really that goal of having as healthy patients as we possibly can. Not repeating services, not duplicating services, but trying to make sure that the services are there for a healthy community overall. Another tool that we oftentimes and talk about is this quadruple aim. Uh, really within the healthcare sector, they talk about the quadruple aim versus in the public health sector, they talk about public health 3.0. They're kind of like the same things, and I bring both of them up here because, again, we have these like different languages that the two worlds use, and I bring them back together to say, like, we really have a lot more in common than different. And this is really thinking about how do we think about that patient's experience, the population health as a whole, reducing the cost. And then it used to be called the triple aim. It's really been transitioned to the quadruple aim, and that's because of the well-being of the care team. 
And it became clear that if you weren't caring for the nurses, the doctors, the technicians who were caring for people and making sure that they were thriving, then you weren't going to have healthy patients as well. And so if you didn't have that key component of it, so you'll see a lot of the kind of conversation has changed from this triple aim to this quadruple aim within healthcare. And so this is a lot of what you know, the big providences of the world and the Aetnas and the Primeras are talking about is how do we think about the quadruple aim uh, for healthcare? How do we think about all four of those factors and how do they kind of tie in together? And you can see population health is a part of it, but it's also thinking into this bigger picture. The other thing I would say about this is the healthiest, pa the cheapest patients are healthy patients. And so there's a real financial incentive for these companies to think about health if we can really tie in for a longer period of time. If they're not just covering a person for two years when they're employed at this one company, but they're employed for a longer period of time, and we have mechanisms to really thinking about how to keep that person healthy over a longer period of time. That helps the person because they're healthier, but it also helps the system because it's cheaper. And so there, everyone's got incentives and different mechanisms within our system. And so thinking about both of those things together. So doing a little bit deeper dive looking into Alaska data specifically. So this looks at leading causes of premature death in 2020. I'm going to talk about this first graph here, and then I'm going to talk about specific attributable risk factors next. And so you're going to see on the top line, you're going to see Alaska, and then on the like, lighter blue is the United States as a whole. And you can see across the country, it's pretty similar in the sense that unintentional injuries, cancers, and heart disease are kind of our leading causes of premature death. What premature death is, is they take the estimated age that most people would die at. So let's just do for even numbers and say it's 70. And say someone dies at 50, that would be counted as 20 years of premature death, 20 years earlier than you would expect. So a child dying at you know, age two is going to add a lot more years of premature death than as someone at 69 who dies of a cancer. And so that's why you see unintentional injuries. Well, that's not the leading cause of death. It's the leading cause of premature death. And that's because we do see a lot of injuries in children, adolescents as kind of the leading cause of death and why that really kind of rises up. You just get so many years lost with that. And then you can see cancer is next, heart disease, suicide, liver disease, homicide, diabetes, and chronic respiratory disease. And you can see where Alaska really stands different, honestly, is in that suicide and that liver. We have about twice the rates of, uh, of leading causes of premature death from suicide and liver disease in this state compared to the nation as a whole. So looking at how we're kind of an outlier along those lines. And then when you look at like risk factors that may have contributed to it, so behaviors and health behaviors that people choose or that a community chooses that lead to premature death, um, overweight, obesity, smoking, and alcohol consumption really are those top three. Those are like the major things that are leading uh, to premature death uh, overall when you're thinking about behavior risk factors. So when we think about the population as a whole, how can we uh, intervene? What can we do to encourage education and awareness? Where can we focus our time and money and effort the best? Thinking about obesity, inactivity, overweight, smoking, and alcohol are kind of our three behaviors to be able to focus on. And where we're really seeing that, that graph, the life expectancy dip, is really in the suicide liver disease uh, component. And that's true nationwide, but Alaska has been, um, unfortunately, had a higher burden of what we call uh, deaths of despair um, in that category. This is a little bit of a, an additional graph to look at suicide specifically. So you see this is 2015 to 2020 data, with Alaska having about twice the suicide rate as the US as a whole. You'll see this true about most uh, kind of Western states. So we have been leading the country uh, for the highest suicide rate for some time. But we sometimes are bumped out of that place by either Wyoming or Montana. But it's a lot of the Western states that have been kind of leading this for, all, uh, for quite a while. A couple reasons uh, that are thought to be this. Uh, isolation, social isolation. People kind of living on their own, their own thing. We see that social connection is a protective factor just in general. Access to firearms is likely a significant contributing cause. 60 to 70 percent of deaths that are suicide related uh, are involved with a firearm. There's just not a lot of chance to rethink a problem uh, with a firearm. And so there's more work particularly being done in Colorado and Montana about safing locking up guns uh, you know, by someone who's suicidal to kind of provide some more space between feeling overwhelmed and action within there to try to get someone help or to try to just get through that moment at that time. But you'll see that really amongst the Western states. And then you'll see this uh, graph on the left. I find this really interesting um, you know, and heartbreaking at the same time. But this is suicidal rates amongst uh, adolescents. So this is 15 to 19 year olds. Um, and what you see over time, like if you go back to the 1970s, you really saw this real peak of suicides, uh, particularly for boys in the 1990s. And I think we have this perception that it's really bad right now. And we do see a lot of mental health right now. 
But it was also really bad, like in the 1990s as well, particularly amongst boys. And it came down and then starting to go up. But then girls are really coming up more than we saw previously. So we're starting to see kind of a diff little bit of a different gender difference there. Um, so I think sometimes how we talk about it, just awareness uh, within it, but we, we have seen this disproportionate burden, particularly in men's. And this is the only group, the only age group where you see suicide as the leading cause of death. So um, younger, it's unintentional uh, injuries and accidents, and older, you start to get into more diseases. But really, this adolescent suicide continues to be the leading cause of death uh, for that age group. That is different than suicide attempts, and I think it is important to kind of separate those out a little bit. Clearly, one can lead to another, but nine out of 10 people who survive a suicidal attempt will not go on to commit suicide. And so I think it's important to separate those and realize that we do have interventions and things can really work in this space to help minimize or reduce the risk, or again, having those places to pause and check to try to minimize the risk of actually um, a, a coming uh, through and, and to committing suicide. This is a little bit more recent data. This is 2018 to 2021. And I think what's really striking uh, to me on this graph, you see you know, this real burden in the 15 to 40 year old age group. That's where you see the peak of it. Uh, but if you look more recently, the 11 to 14 year old group and the greater than 60, really in this pandemic, that's where we've seen a real burden um, of increase in suicide attempts. In the state of Alaska, we actually have not seen an increased rate of suicides, but we've seen an increased rate of suicide attempts and mental illness, particularly in the young and in the old, who I think have been really disproportionately impacted by the social isolation that we saw, by the disruption in life um, throughout. And we, and we are seeing that, unfortunately, in our data uh, currently. And we started to see that in 2020, but you can see really 2021, it really it took off. Um, versus you're not seeing that same, that same degree in like the 40 to 60 year old age group uh, overall. This also then looks at overdose rates, and this is uh, another one of those deaths of despair that we really see a decrease in the life expectancy where we have ability to intervene, but you see Alaska versus the U.S. as a whole. So Alaska is in that kind of hash to dotted line versus U.S. is in the solid line there. So all drugs uh, is going to be the blue versus all opioids is in the yellow in the U.S. Um, and then you can see Alaska in that dotted line uh, there. And we've seen just a real increase overall. Alaska had the highest rate of increase in drug overdoses last year. So in general, we've had less overdoses uh, in, in Alaska than, than, other, than the rest of the lower 48, but we're kind of increasing at a faster rate now. And the majority of those are caused by fentanyl. Um, and so we're seeing about 70 to 80% of overdoses right now have fentanyl somewhere in it. So it may be that someone took, uh, you know, their knee hurt and their friend said, hey, why don't you go ahead and take one of these pills that might help and think it's a Percocet or an oxycodone and it's a counterfeit pill. We're seeing somewhere between four to six out of every counterfeit pills that are taken or found now by the DEA have fentanyl in them and one pill can be enough to kill. And so people may be thinking they're taking a normal pill and this is something safe to take and it's not. We're also seeing fentanyl uh, in heroin, we're seeing it in cocaine, we're seeing it in methamphetamine. So we're seeing it mixed with all sorts of other illicit substances. So you know, see people who say, I you know, have been stable on $20 of heroin, and, and then they suddenly overdose it because it's got a little bit of fentanyl in it. So fentanyl is incredibly concentrated, a very small amount in there. And so it is some people who have really struggled with addiction for a long time, but clearly there are other people who have not struggled with addiction and are at a party or take one or take a little bit, and that is enough to kill. And so again, just like we talked about with suicide with guns, there's just not a lot of gap or a lot of distance between a little bit to death when you've got something like fentanyl in where such a small quantity can be enough to kill and why we're seeing such an increase in suicide, or excuse me, overdose deaths. And then here again is Alaska's overdose deaths more recently, so 2012 through 2021. Total drug overdoses, narcotics, uh, and then sedatives you see really have an increase, so like benzodiazepines. Uh, and in psychotropic medications, you've also seen an uh, increase as well. So you've really seen a spike uh, here recently um, and trying to do a lot. And again, Dr. Simon's in the back, but has done a lot actually statewide to really kind of help with this issue. And I'm really fortunate that you guys have him here. So how do we chart a path forward? So we kind of highlighted a few of those kind of heavy burdens that are pulling down uh, those deaths of despair and pulling down our life expectancy and, and thinking about how do we think about our system differently. This is a fable that is told a lot within public health uh, stories. If you go to a public health conference, this oftentimes comes up. And you know, you see someone drowning in the river and you run, you pull that person out of the river, and then you see another person coming, drowning, you pull them out of the river. And then suddenly, you know, after you're pulling and pulling all these people out, someone else says, why are you pulling those people up? Why don't we walk upstream and figure out why they're all falling into the river? And you find out they're falling into the river because the bridge is broken, or because they're being pushed by the winds of life into the river, or whatever metaphor you want to use. And so can you go upstream to prevent them from coming into the stream and pick them up? 
But our healthcare system is really set up to pull people out of the stream. And as an ER physician, I literally am like pulling people out of the stream. And that's where I just became really frustrated and burnt out. Like all I'm doing is pulling people out of the stream. How do we move upstream to be able to think about why people are falling in and trying to minimize that? The problem is there's not very much incentive within our system. So every dollar that we spend on healthcare, 87, to 9, 87 cents to 91 cents is spent on kind of that subspecialty acute care setting. We got six to 10 cents spent on primary care and we got three cents spent on prevention. So where we spend our dollars is that end. We don't spend our dollars on that upstream. And it's part of the reason we're falling into that stream with like decreasing life expectancy. But it's hard. It's hard to like let that person be walking by and be like, no, I'm not going to spend my money this way and I'm going to spend it that way. I've got this really rare disease. I've got, you know, my father just recently, you know, had pancreatic cancer. Like, let's just try one more thing and see what we can do, you know, because you want to do everything for that loved one at the end of life. Uh, and it's interesting how different countries have set up different ways of thinking about the way that they spend money to think about prevention. Um, and I don't think it has to be one or the other. I think that when you've got less people falling in, there's less need to spend downstream. And so uh, we can think about how we can just slowly start to move upstream so we've got less people falling in downstream. And then how do we you know, have that physical environment, behaviors, clinical care, socioeconomic, all fit together for those health outcomes? So I point people to the Healthy Alaska. This is considered the health improvement plan from the state. So every 10 years, the state, in combination with the tribes and many local partners, get together and say, go through similar data, what's really plugging the state, and what do we want to do about it? Like, how are we going to make this better? And we choose a series of goals, and we say, these are our goals to try to make our state better in the next 10 years. The problem with this, I don't find a lot of people engaging with it in the same sort of way. I mean, how many of you had ever heard of Healthy Alaskans before you got here tonight? Okay, we got like four. I think this is like the most I've ever seen when I do a presentation. You guys are like the most educated I have ever seen in this. Most people are like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I have this one widget over here that will fix the whole system. I'm like, I would love the one widget like we talked about earlier, but I don't think it exists. On the other hand, there's, there's this kind of healthy Alaskans and how we can think about what are our problems overall. And so oftentimes when I'm presenting to clinicians, I'm presenting to hospitals, I challenge them. I'm like, you pick three of these things on the list that meet your clinic, your hospital, and I would challenge you all, whatever program you work in, job you work in, or your life that you see, and choose one, two, or three of these that really mean something to you and engage in it. So it might be how many, ch like a child being connected to three healthy adults who care about them. And so maybe you're going to spend your time to be working with the school district to make sure that more kids feel connected to more adults in their world to have additional supportive and protective factors. So I would challenge you, even if you're not in healthcare, there are many things within Healthy Alaskans that each and every one of us could say, that is a goal that I see I could help with and I'm going to find a way to be engaged in. So I really encourage everyone to take a look at Healthy Alaskans and pick one or two of those goals and try to find a way in your community, in your life, in your relationships to be able to invest in so that we can all pull that oar together and we can all say, we're gonna make a difference for these things. This is our health improvement plan. This is where we're going and then be engaged as we make the next set of what are our goals to move forward and moving forward. So it sets the priorities, it has goals. They're supposed to be ambitious but measurable. They're supposed to be evidence-based strategies. They promote health improvement. It's the only state where it's co-led between tribes and the state. Everywhere else is just done by the state. So here we co-lead it together. And the goal is to engage communities at many different levels. So that is one way that I think the state of Alaska and we all can start to think about how we move forward. Here's just some specific ones, you know, so reducing cancer mortality, recent, these are all things that we saw improvement on on this last year. So we saw a reduction in cancers, we saw a reduction in recent tobacco usage, we saw a reduction in overweight adults, we saw an increased rate, rate of adolescents who saw that they got help from adults who could seek help, they saw a reduction in binge drinking, a reduction of binge drinking of both adolescents and adults, decreased rates of adults not being able to afford a doctor, and increase in high school diplomas. So sometimes we talk about all the bad within the healthcare system, but I wanna highlight, like, these are all places that we've been able to collectively start to make a difference. These are all part of the Healthy Alaskan goals where we're starting to see improvement. And granted, they're not all there. So 17 are not improved, seven have improved, and uh, eight have met targets. So we've got, we got room to go on a lot of them. But I just wanted to highlight some of the successes where I think we are starting to make a difference. And on that slide too, you know, we've got like the quit line and the play every day and the comprehensive cancer partnership. These are all partners that are helping with each of these goals. I'm like, this is my, my lane and my focus and this is really where I'm gonna help with in that space. 
Um, again, it's unique in that kind of tribal partnership. It has this collective impact and kind of outlining those objectives. We do have a website that's healthyalaskans.org where you can go through it and you can look at it and you can see the metrics over time change as we get additional uh, data in. And here are the kind of categories that they're divided into. Healthy weight and nutrition, environmental health, access to health care, tobacco and alcohol, mental health and suicide, injury and violence, infectious disease, cancer and chronic disease, and social and preventative factors. And then each one of those has sub-goals within it. Again, part of the goal was they need to be evidence-based and they need to be measurable. So they may not be the thing that's going to make the biggest difference, but we wanted things that we could measure and things that we had evidence. If we were able to do this, we were able to see outcomes uh, overall. So those are kind of the subcommittees and how they are, how they are decided. I would just highlight this, um, and so this is kind of thinking about systems of care, but just like we talked about the individual, and then we've also talked about the collective impact, how healthy each one of us are helps to help the collective impact. So my first ask to you all is to find something in Healthy Alaskans 2030 that you can engage in. My second ask to you all is to engage in Healthy You in 2022. So we're really trying to challenge all Alaskans to be engaged in their health this year and thinking about what their health looks like. So we've talked a lot about chronic disease during COVID. We've talked a lot about comorbidities. I mean, 73% of Alaskans have one or more comorbidities that lead to higher risk for COVID-19. And that you know, affects all sorts of things of life, not just COVID but others. And here you can see kind of the underlying severe chronic conditions. Uh, and you can see obesity, not having physical activity, depressive disorders. These are the things that really lead to more severe COVID-19, but also lead to more severe disease just in general. And the more healthy you are, the better you're going to be able to deal with not only uh, an infection, but also an earthquake. So prevention really is helping to take care of ourselves and our individual selves. So engaging in healthy you. I think it's a little bit more on the next slide. Yeah. And so what we did is we broke it down into kind of th uh, four different focuses, activity, mind, bodies, and habit. Uh, we also have a website for this. There's a website for everything these days. Um, and uh, really focusing on each quarter. The first one was on trying to be active and what activity looks like. If you haven't ever watched the video, 23 and a half hours, I would encourage you to just Google tonight, 23 and a half hours. It's a, it's a physician and he goes through and does a cartoon drawing. If you've got 23 and a half hours to do whatever you want to do in your day, but for a half hour every day, just be physically active. And he goes through a whole bunch of data and science about just even if that's walking, if that is taking your dog, if that is, you don't have to go run an Ironman, but being active for at least a half hour a day in one way or another, and all of the health impacts of that. So just finding ways to be active, going up the set of stairs, parking a little bit further away, taking your bike ride. How to make sure that we're engaging our minds um, and how that we can take care of our mental health. We talked about the impact of suicide, how we can stay connected as a community. Thanks to UAF for putting things together like this to find ways for people to be connected and having these conversations because they matter for our community. Finding ways to take care of our body and thinking about our food and nutrition. So healthy habits as well as healthy food are on there. There's social media, there's uh, videos on there. Some of the videos are like really fun to kind of see different ways that people are engaging in their overall health and we are doing a whole series of these. Um, and the idea behind it is really trying to engage individuals to think about their overall health and how to be active. So you know, here's one of the short stories uh, that's on there. And, uh, how I move, how I thrive, how I nourish, how I persist. The last quarter is on habits, so how can you make these habits into your atomic habits for next year and how you can kind of continue that process. So again, thinking about that individual and thinking about that population. So we talked about how to think about the population health and then how to think about the individual health uh, overall. And just some more additional data for, you know, every way that you count, you know, matters, the best health to aim for 150 minutes of active activity. There's all sorts of different ways you can break it up. Even the five to 10 minute active breaks uh, throughout the day make a big difference. So finding ways to build that into your everyday life. And then prevention. We talked about the impact of you know, accidental injuries uh, in those preventable deaths. So this is a huge thing in the state of Alaska, but making sure that people are protecting their brains, making sure that we're choosing healthy drinks and food without uh, added sugar on it and thinking about those healthy choices. Um, the current theme that they're running through on the Department of Health website right now is the store outside your door. Uh, and, uh, you know, berry picking and Dr. Nace and I were just, she was like, okay, we got to go pick uh, raspberries for 15 minutes before you do that lecture. So we like frantically just picked a whole bunch of raspberries before we got here. Uh, and so we were just talking about like the importance of kind of just getting out, doing those other things uh, and engaging. And we're just so fortunate in this state to have so many opportunities to do that, particularly this time of year. Smoking uh, is a huge risk factor for cardiovascular disease and others so engaging our friends or community or loved ones. The single biggest impact that someone, the best way to impact someone who is smoking is if a loved one says, I'm concerned about your smoking, I'm concerned about your health. 
Um, interestingly, alcohol, the single best intervention point is when someone is in a crisis, and particularly a physician in the emergency department or other place, and says, this is really impacting your health. Um, how can we help you in that time? So we all need to be asking those questions. It can be hard in the ER when things are overwhelming and moving fast to say, I, I really need you to, like, what can we do to help you intervene at this moment to think about your health? Um, because we're seeing some really negative impacts. And I encourage you all as friends and family members to engage in helping to support healthy choices amongst those that you live, because you may be the difference between them smoking or not smoking. Um, when kids ask their parents to stop smoking, that's the most single effective way to get them to stop smoking. It makes a big difference there. And thinking about these system level priorities and strategies, so how do you build these things uh, together? Data modernization is a big part of what we're thinking about the states. This is going to get this last little bit of the lecture is talking a little bit more what we're doing at the states. So we've talked about like what you all can do, and then thinking about what we within the Department of Health can do to be able to build these things together. Um, I was again just at Fairbanks Memorial earlier today talking about the frustrations of electronic medical record and I was like, come try work for a state. It's really <laughs> much harder. <laughs> um, we have really antiquated health IT systems within the state. Um, most of our systems you know, uh, were built before the iPhone. We put uh, National Guard in our state public health lab during the COVID pandemic to write one positive test into three different systems because they didn't match together. Uh, the amount of just sheer will force and time that we had to spend to just get the simplest data elements to cross from one place to another such that Fairbanks could see how many positives you had is unreal and honestly unacceptable. I mean, the amount of time and effort and people and manpower that we can't continue. There isn't that funding to continue, nor should we continue. Like, we need to have these beta, basic data systems to be able to cross. So we're really trying to focus on this. It's safer this way. It's more secure if we're able to have uh, secure data systems that move closely and connect. Um, they do not have to have patient identifier. There's a lot of ways we need to think about. I mean, think about how hard it is to get from point A to point B or getting on a plane if you didn't have a boarding pass, your phone, and that same sort of stuff. Like, that's how we're asking public health and state government to try to work to deal with these big problems without the basic fundamental tools. And, you know, people say all the time, well, now with monkeypox, now with this, why isn't it any better? And I'm like, because we didn't change any of the systems <laughs> that make it better. Like, I still have the antiquated system that I had before, and I still have it now today, and I don't have a different system, so we're going to continue to get the same results. So if we have another really highly contagious infectious disease, we're going to get the same results if we don't have better data systems to give people individual information and tools in their local community to make individual actions. Um, I would love to see it so that just like I checked my weather forecast before I came up here, I could check my infectious disease forecast before I flew to another state. And I could just see how much flu is circulating, what, how much COVID is circulating. And my mom with chronic lung conditions can be like, I'm going to wait for a little bit, or I'm going to make sure that I mask, or I don't, so that we can make individual decisions based on our individual risk factors and, and kind of our comfort level and why we're going or why we're choosing what we do, and are really able to make data-informed decisions rather than these kind of very blunt tools that we've had to use so far. The next big thing that we're really trying to work on is addressing healthcare workforce. Um, people are burned out. People are tired. Um, we are seeing across the board a lack of uh, just people in the employment industry and being able to work. Uh, but really, within healthcare, you know, prior to the pandemic, you saw twice the suicide rate amongst healthcare providers than you even saw in the military. Um, the overall burden and the mental health strain of working within healthcare is tremendous. And that was pre pandemic. And so throughout this past couple years, it has been exhausting. It's been frustrating. There has been more animosity. I would say that probably this community more than any, like your support to your local community with like the signs and like we support you and care for you was awesome to see. Uh, it's not happened at many other places across the country, um, but this is hard. Uh, and so how do we make sure people take care of breaks? It's hard to be a caregiver if you can't care for yourself. How do we give people permission to care for themselves? How do we not place the blame of burnout on the individual. I can't yoga my way through a system to be better. <laughs> like I have to make the system better. And burnout is not the failure of the person. Burnout is the failure of the system to not support the, to the, support the person. So how can we think about health workforce and encourage the next generation? We're all going to need healthcare in one way or another, and we want people to be engaged. So thinking a lot about funds, thinking about community resources, also thinking about things like community health workers. And this doesn't all have to be nurses and physicians. There's a lot of different critical people and personnel that we can use along a spectrum of care that can help support people in their health journey at multiple different places. And so um, I think Alaska is a little bit further behind than other places in thinking about how to use allied professionals across the spectrum to help support health overall and thinking about the health and well-being. And then these are some just innovation projects. You know, many people have probably heard of the 1115 uh, project. 1115 is just a term that we use when we do Medicaid differently. 
And so basically what Medicaid is, is they say, okay, state, for people under this uh, income level, you can go ahead and get either 100% or 90% match for being able to provide care from the federal government, but these are all the rules you have to follow. Well, the state can come back and say, like, your rules are cool and all, but I don't like your rules. I think if you do your rules this way, we can actually save more money and do it better. And they say, show us, and that's called an 1115 demonstration project. <laughs> so that's what an 1115 is. We just have one of them, so we refer to it as the 1115 waiver. <laughs> um, most states have like two to 15 1115s. Like they have lots of different ways of thinking about the way that healthcare is done differently. So ours is really on behavioral health, thinking about adverse childhood experiences and moving upstream. It's still very much kind of under getting going and getting people engaged and billing Medicaid is really challenging and we can get into that if you all want to, but that's, that's basically, we're also thinking about what ways do we say, that's cool federal government, but that's not gonna work for Alaska. What's gonna work for Alaska is if we do it differently this way. So what are their spas, what are the 1115s, what are the ways can we change some of these programs to make sure that we're thinking of soon? How can we think about the value, cost of healthcare, it's huge for businesses, uh, and thinking about transparency so people aren't surprised by bills. Think about all payer claims databases. These are all things that are currently being worked on. The crisis care continuum. Uh, this really is working a lot with the mental health trust, thinking about kind of the three pillars of crisis care. So the first is uh, when someone calls and needs help, we now have the 988 number that you can call and that can directly connects you to a mental health provider. Fairbanks was actually the first place to have mobile integrated behavioral health response team. So when you call 911 or 988, they can send out a mental health provider, not just a police officer. It's working really well here in Fairbanks and it's being used across the state and in fact across the nation to understand how that's working and being able to take that further. 23 hour stabilizations where people can be stabilized when they're in an acute crisis rather than hospitalized or waiting in the emergency department for long periods of time uh, to be able to move forward. So how can we take those tools and move forward and working a lot with the mental health trust and then again, thinking about childhood, thinking about at mitigating adverse childhood uh, experiences overall. So that is just a brief overview of uh, healthcare and healthcare scorecard. I sometimes joke that I'm not the chief medical officer of COVID, but the chief medical officer of the state of Alaska. Uh, this is actually the stuff that I came here to do and get really excited about, thinking about the ways that we can all collectively move upstream and think about prevention. And I usually end with this slide because I just love the fact that we all have our hands on this and we all are part of this journey. It takes the providers, it takes patients, it takes policymakers, it takes the public and public engagement, it takes the press, it takes all five of those pieces to make change. Uh, and so thank you for being here tonight, to being engaged, and I look forward to partnering with all of you and finding ways to have a healthier tomorrow. So I'm happy to take any questions and I'll turn it over. If, if I could ask, yep. if, you, if you could repeat the question, we'll be able to pick it up. No problem, yep, sounds good. You can ask me whatever you want. Yes, sir. One of your earlier slides where you compared health care costs against life expectancy for the countries in, in the U.S. was the outlier. Uh, I think that ended three or four years ago. Um, and, and, and it didn't look like it was getting any better. It looks like the U.S. is going flatter to the right, and I suspect it's even worse now, nine or $10,000. In your travels around and talking to people, do you have any reason to Optimistic, or should we all go work in New Zealand? Oh, yeah, so great question. It was like, look at the slide and traveling around. Should we just all be pessimists and go to New Zealand, or do we have reasons to be optimistic? Um, I guess I will answer that in two parts. I would say, yes, it is getting worse from the early data that we can see. So we are seeing increasing costs uh, and we are seeing decreased life expectancy. How much the pandemic will have changed that? You know, we've definitely seen, I mean, it's the third leading cause of death in Alaska. It was the number one leading cause of death across the country. We spent a lot of money on it. So that's gonna be kind of like we saw that blip earlier with the, with the 1918 pandemic. It's clearly gonna be an outlier and how this can impact long COVID and other healthcare costs, I think are yet to be determined. So that's clearly there. There's another slide that I didn't provide on here that looks at states and compares states and how much they spend their life expectancy overall. We actually have decent life expectancy, we just have high costs. In many of the rural states, that is the case, just really high costs. Um, interesting, like Hawaii, um, Massachusetts, those are kind of the lowest cost, highest life expectancy um, out there. Um, and so you can already see state differences. And so I guess that kind of gets into my second, you know, second part of your question, is there a reason to be optimistic? I think I'm inherently an optimistic person. <laughs> um, and I think that there are all sorts of things where we see movement and change. So for example, CMS before was very much, I'm just gonna pay for care. I'm just gonna pay Medicare, Medicaid when you show up to the hospital. They are now saying, please 
do 1115s, do them creatively. We want to pay for upstream prevention because we know it's going to save us. We see health insurance companies now in the lower, lower 48 building uh, entire grocery stores to make sure that regions don't have food deserts and they have access to healthy food because they know that that makes a big difference for the health of the population of that region. We see in Oregon, in rural parts of Oregon, where um, a health insurance did like a, uh, a what's called CCO, um, uh, this model for kind of Medicaid care within a region. And basically that region had money and if they minimized their hospitalizations, they were able to save money and they were able to reinvest that in elder care at home, at fall prevention and in schools and the community got to choose how they were gonna use that money. So we're starting to see all these like interventions and tools, and I kind of think of it like braiding this blanket, like the stitching is coming together <laughs> and the tools are there. Um, I think it's just, it's up to Alaska if we're going to step into that space and we're gonna engage and we're gonna say, what does this mean and how do we wanna take these tools that are now becoming available and make them Alaskan and being able to move forward. So I would say don't move to, I mean, New Zealand's beautiful, but I'd say don't move there yet. Uh, <laughs> um, and I think there's something exciting about thinking about what this makes sense in our state and our country. And I think one of the great things about our country in general is that things are very different across the country and states depending on, and what, some things work in area and some things don't. Um, I love the saying, fail fast. So let's look at ways that we failed. Let's do that fast and let's move on. Uh, and let's figure out ways to uh, really kind of lead the country and potentially the world in healthcare, like we've done in innovation and other things across the world. So I remain optimistic. I have to. <laughs> other questions? A great question. Yes? I have a question, but just a comment. Okay. Um, we have uh, four children in various states and mm -hmm. lots of other family in various states. Throughout the whole crisis, I would tell my kids and other family, watch Anne. Alaska, <laughs> because you answered the questions, you stayed on point, you got the, got things, the information to people, and we felt informed. And I, I appreciate it. My kids and my grandkids appreciate it. <laughs> you did great. Well, thank you for the kind comment. Um, for those in Zoom land, I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but it was just uh, it was a very kind comment about just trying to inform. Again, I, I had no idea. I'm not an infectious disease doc. I oftentimes say. My role in the state is very similar to my role in the ER. I'm not the cardiologist. I'm not the orthopedic surgeon. I'm not the loved one caring for that patient. I'm the emergency medicine doc who my job is to just try to build and to take those pieces that are needed for the person in front of me. And with COVID, it was really about how can we take the pieces that we have? How can we not have our PPE bought out from underneath us? How can we make sure we have equal access to vaccine? How can we make sure that we get that to regions and they know their patients, they know their community the best and just get it out there so they could do it? And how can we let the infectious disease docs be the infectious disease docs, the governors be the governors, the mayors be the mayors, the families be the families, uh, and to be able to pull those tools together. Um, so it's been a huge honor. It kind of feels like being strapped to the front of a rocket ship for the last three years, but uh, it's, I've learned a lot uh, for sure. Um, but I can't imagine doing this job in any other place besides Alaska because Alaskans are the ones who rose to the challenge. And Alaskans every single day found ways to care for their community in completely inspiring ways. And that made the job um, a real privilege. So, yeah. Um, I'd also like to compliment the state and your leadership at the beginning of the COVID outbreak. But uh, prior to that, public health had suffered tremendous uh, losses in funding and staffing, yep. and then boosted uh, for a short period of time to meet the need of COVID. Since then, uh, those positions are gone. And uh, I was talking to someone today, there is one itinerant covering the entire interior of Alaska, and there's four other public health nurses. And there used to be one for each region, and people were working out in the community, and you know, there's been a decrease in family planning, there's been a decrease in immunizations, and I just feel like um, in the next year or two, we really need to look critically at those numbers of STDs which are going up and immunization rates which are going down mm -hmm. and unwanted pregnancies that are going up. And all of the success that did happen, I, I mean, we could crash big time. Mm -hmm. The lab uh, has half the staff that they have and they've lost their temporary COVID positions. And so, um, and it took a while to ramp up for that. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we've learned something in COVID and can 
not have to do that again. Uh, you know, it's really important that the legislator know how bare bones and, as you said, burned out everybody is. Um, if you need us all to talk to them, it's <laughs> really important. You know, you have 10 years, 20 years of progress, and it can all be gone in three. Yeah. So I appreciate the question and the comment. It was really about kind of the challenges within the public health infrastructure, the lack of funding, the unfilled positions, uh, and the real concerns of what that looks like and what we're seeing, as you mentioned, increased rates of STIs, increased you know, rates of depression and mental illness. And you know, I completely agree with everything that you said Sorry. in that space. No, no, it's, it's, I'm glad you brought it up in mentioning you know, a couple different things. Sometimes I feel like this fall, we're expected to have you know, a billion dollar response with $100,000, right? Like they're like, how come I don't have testing here? How come I'm like, I don't have any funding to do any of that anymore. Like I had a lot of federal funding during COVID times. I have none of that now. We had emergency procurement that allowed us to emergency procure things. I, we don't have that. Federal government is kind of, you know, really ramping down all, a lot of their ability to provide a lot of additional tools. So there, I think there will be this expectation that there's this response. That on top of it is, as you mentioned, really a real decrease in workforce. I talked about healthcare burnout. There was a study that came out from the CDC looking at, health, at public health workforce. 76% of public health workers showed significant signs of PTSD and 12%, I think it was 12% were suicidal. I mean, huge rates, and we see it within our staff all the time. Exhausted, have worked every single day. So we're very intentionally in trying to meaningfully provide breaks and you know, not calling it vacation, but annual leave, like looking at the military and others who have really helped to say, what is, how do you handle long, prolonged periods of stress and make sure that people are able to take care of themselves and others, and how can we learn from other workforces to be able to do that? And, and honestly, looking a lot in the military, particularly with the, the aspect that public health has really been criticized in many ways. You know, one of our epidemiologists used to say, I, I went to the store and people would ask what I do, and I used to really stand proudly and say I work in public health, and now I'm afraid someone's gonna hurt me if I say that. And so you see this just kind of real mental drain on this kind of pushback. Um, and, and you know, I can understand the reasons why people have been frustrated, people have lost their jobs, income, livelihood. This pandemic has been devastating, and I, I get that. And the people you see are, you know, me as a talking head on TV or CDC or other things, and people are angry, and I, I understand that reasoning, but it's really causing a huge uh, burnout of public health. On top of that, one out of five state positions right now is not filled. So just try doing your job with like 20% less of the people in general, particularly things like itinerant nurses to go to the interior. I mean, we have so many positions open right now for itinerant nurses and cannot hire in them. We are now on our fifth round of trying to hire for a data modernization person. And to change the way that we pay for it or the structures take a whole process within state government that does not go easy or smooth. And people are like, why would I come work for you when it takes you five months to post that job when I can go work for Google and get paid five times as much and I'll have a job next week? And I'm like, I don't we're cool, like come make a difference. Like it becomes hard to like sell the change, you know, after a while because people need a livelihood and people, there's a lot of job opportunities out there. Um, so I, it is a huge, huge challenge. And I think the work and the lift is even more than it was before. So a couple things I'd say about that. First, funding matters and we fund our priorities. Um, there was a great line that I learned from a legislator once and they said, remember to a legislator, Four constituent calls is the same as a randomized controlled study is to you as a healthcare provider. And that was like enough to like sink my heart slowly. Um, but over time, I have uh, come to embrace that. We all have our incentives, we all have our priorities. And as a scientist, a randomized controlled tell really tells me what I need to know. But if I'm someone who's gonna be elected, it makes sense that people calling me and telling me what they think, I'm there to represent them. That is their currency. And so voices matter, I would say that. Two, I think we really need to buy, build in and make better ways for healthcare to pay for public health. So when I get a grant in from the CDC, there's a portion of that that I have to take out to do administrative costs. Well, should we have insurance, have a portion of their profit go to paying for public health so we have a more sustained stream for the healthcare that's gonna save them money from a health insurance perspective long run? Can we build those models together? How about CMS, Medicare and Medicaid, instead of just paying for things that are really costly and expensive at the end, can they pay for basic preventative healthcare work as well? And so you see some private sector moving that direction. I think it's getting there over time, and there's been a lot when this gets to the optimism question. I think you're starting to see more movement on that so that we don't have this boom and bust cycle that we've had in the past with public health, but that it isn't public health is over there and it's grant funded or it's GF funded or it's the extra thing that we think about when oil days are good. But public health helps to keep us overall healthy and how do we build that into our overall structure 
And then things like grant funding are ways to think about innovative change, not the sustained workforce that's needed to do health. And I think we need to change the way that we think about it so it is sustained. But it's a shift. It's a mindset shift. It's an economic shift. It's a 1115 shift. It's an insurance shift. There's a lot of shifts uh, to that space. And so that's a lot of what we're talking about nationally. I would also say that from a national perspective, again, CMS, who pays for Medicare and Medicaid, back in the 1980s said, you know, we're not OK with people showing up in the emergency department and not being stabilized before treating them and sending them. So they came up with EMTALA, which is this you know, Emergency Medicine Treatment and Stabilization Act. You've got to treat and stabilize someone. And we can argue the benefits and successes and weaknesses of it, but hospitals now have ERs, and they'll stabilize people regardless of the ability to pay. And so do we need an EMTALA-like thing for, for public health? That if you are going to participate in federal payment for health care, Medicaid, Medicare, that there is basic public health things that you will do for your community. Um, and so that may be some data sharing components, that may be some public health measures, that may be being involved in community health needs assessment, so that that is a part of participation in CMS. And so you can choose not to participate in it, but you could choose to participate in it. It's what ways look for it. So lots of conversation around there. Um, and uh, I always encourage public voices uh, to be a part of <laughs> these conversations. Um, and I, I think that we need to think about it in long-term sustainable ways so that we build these build these braids back together again. So thanks for that question. Yeah? Yeah. Um, thanks for uh, having that slide going back to it. Oh, yeah? <laughs> the I, depressing uh, one? <laughs> I've been 80% deaf since before I could uh, walk, so I got a lot, but I missed a lot. Sorry. Um, I traveled out of the country 30 times, about five months each. And, and even when I was much younger, which was a long time ago, I would after a month in a foreign country, eating in South America or Europe, uh, my body would transform quite a bit, lose weight, feel better, mm. constitution, yada, yada. And so I realized that there's something about the food in America, particularly in Alaska, maybe where the glyphosate people or something like that. Tremendous difference. Uh, in May, uh, you spoke to the news writer, it came out before, that uh, most of the people getting sick or dying of COVID are not it's not necessarily unvaccinated, although I don't know if the hospitals are keeping a good track of who was, but we're 70 or older. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I finally got COVID in Sicily in early February. Didn't have any of the usual, no fever or, or headache or <clears throat> oxygen. It was much better than breathing the air in Fairbanks when I had COVID. And, uh, and I tested myself every day. I also tested myself a couple of days before I was positive. And every day, a nine days positive. Didn't leave my room for nine. Um, and, but what, what it did is it got into my blood and it uh, gave me phlebitis and thrombosis mm -hmm. or something like that. And so I left around for about a month and I forget to die at that time. I'm surprised I made it this far. And it, it still hasn't gone away six mm -hmm. months later. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not in pain like I was. Mm -hmm. I can sleep at night, etc. But so I suspect I could even be wrong, but yeah, you know, obesity and a lot of other things factor in. But Many of us have, older people have um, chronic inflammation. And, and I'm wondering if that is part of the comorbidity and has that been examined? And, and I mean, that may not be an easy uh, question to answer, but I hope it is. Maybe more importantly, is there a um, telemedicine access that we can call? Um, uh, when I got back, uh, I got back in April from Italy, and I called the PVC, and I said, look, yeah, I'm just I'm getting over with COVID. And, and they said, well, you can't come in before August, or you can't pay full price. You only get that conversation from the physical once a year. Mm -hmm. I got full Medicare on so I made it on before August. Is there a telemedicine mm -hmm. number we can call and talk about, you know, most people in the world who have got the mask on, COVID or whatever, that would uh, um, that we could get some answers to? Yes, it's a really great question. Uh, it was about health and health in different communities and kind of what we have here in Alaska versus other places. It was also questions about COVID and thrombophobitis and kind of an inflammatory response. And then another kind of part of that question about telehealth and how can we have access to being able to understand. A couple different things. I do think that diet, food, PFAT, all these other things kind of factor into our health. And I think we're learning a lot about that space and have a lot more to learn. But I'm not an environmental science health expert. And so you know, this state versus that state is hard, um, but does make a big difference in our health. 
The second question about how much do we know about COVID and inflammation? I think we've really, many people think of COVID as this kind of, it's really easy to think about it in this dichotomous black and white. Like it's a respiratory disease, I get a fever, I have a cough. I'm always amazed at how many patients say, I don't feel like I have COVID. And I'm like, you've never had it before, so how do you know what COVID feels like? Uh, but good question. But it, it is a circulatory problem, it's an inflammation problem, it's a neurologic problem, and we are seeing new things that we're learning about it every single day. And I think I will be learning about COVID for my entire medical career. I won't think I will ever stop learning about this disease and all the things. But we do see some people who only present as clots. We see people who present this really significant neurologic factors. We see people who only present like hair loss. So it presents in all sorts of really interesting um, and very different ways, from completely asymptomatic to very kind of typical symptoms, very atypical symptoms. Inflammation in the body's response to the virus clearly is a major part of that. And we saw that early on with the Delta wave and the original of the virus variant that we saw. We saw that the people who got sick, it was in this bimodal distribution. So people got some sort of respiratory thing initially, it got down to those lower lungs, they started to get better. And the ones who got sick are all those stories from New York and the rest of it was the inflammation and an inflammatory cascade that started to happen secondary in the body. And in fact, one of the markers that we look at in the hospital is a D-dimer, which is a, a marker for um, basically the way that your blood clots and it breaks apart. It's the same marker that I would use to think if you had a clot in your legs or your lung. We use that to look at how sick someone is for COVID. So we clearly see that there's a breakdown in the way that the inflammation and the clotting cascade happens, particularly within sicker people uh, with COVID-19. We also see people who had very mild to almost no symptoms with COVID-19. And then six, eight months later, we'll actually start to develop symptoms that then kind of looking back and looking at population level are thought to be attributed to kind of long COVID. So even if someone had very mild symptoms, it doesn't mean that they won't have long COVID symptoms as a whole. So what do we do about it, which is kind of like the next part of your question. We don't have a single number within the state of Alaska to call on that topic. This gets a little bit back to funding. Like I have no funding for a long COVID personnel or coordinator. It's clearly needed, but we don't have that kind of within state government. And then, you know, every hospital has its own place, but we just don't have enough people within the state to really kind of make that more robust. Other places, like I was just in, in Boston, you know, my friend runs a pediatric long COVID clinic. So she's like, you know, the peds and the long COVID, and she has an entire clinic set up for that. So we're seeing the Mayos and the Brighams, and the, they're starting to start clinics along those lines. And we've been really encouraging them to offer telemedicine in additional ways. The Mayo Clinic has done that previously in Alaska, where they're off of that. Um, but the last time I asked, they did not have like a specific kind of call line or way to be able to get additional telehealth. Hopefully with the telehealth bill that was just passed, we'll start to see an increase of telehealth within the state as well for people to be able to access telehealth for just like you said, here are my labs, here's where I'm at, be it some specialty item or be things like long COVID. So that is an entire part of the healthcare sector that I think needs to really be built up. In the meantime, there, uh, we've been trying to offer a whole series of lectures and information sessions to primary care providers and healthcare providers. So we bring in experts from around the country and we say, here's an hour where you can learn all about pediatric long COVID or what testing to, to try to educate the, our healthcare providers within the state in as many ways possible. And there's a bunch of Zooms and lectures uh, that you can go to as a patient as well to learn about long COVID and, and what may be there. I always hate to turn people's like social media to go figure out your answers, but <laughs> that's where we oftentimes see people starting to gather together and get additional answers and resources and we're trying to build out a better website on kind of long COVID. Probably the problem is like, we don't even have a unified definition of what long COVID is. And as you mentioned, someone may have a really inflammatory response, but someone else may have a much more respiratory response and it can be very um, multimodal. So no easy answer there, but I think it's incredibly needed. And I also think overall, this is gonna add a lot of cost to our overall healthcare sector. And we have to find ways to make sure that we're supporting patients long-term uh, so that they can be as healthy and well as possible. So I wish I had a better answer for you, but inflammation for sure. Answer, not yet. Yeah. Is there any news about the broad spectrum vaccines? Yeah, so great question about broad spectrum vaccines. Uh, yes and no. So it, I was actually just on a call with the uh, other governors this morning. Um, and right now the federal government is telling us that we should expect mid-September a bivalent COVID vaccine booster. So it would have likely Delta variant as well as the Omicron BA5, which is the predominant Omicron variant right now, both in there. Um, and the early data, I haven't seen the data, they haven't published it, but what they told us is the early data is looking promising and that would be an additional booster. So currently the recommendations are those 50 and above are immunocompromised to make sure that their boosters are up to date at this point, depending if you're immunocompromised, it depends on how many vaccines. And then likely those 18 and above or might go slightly older come mid-September would be available to like a multivalent uh, vaccine. 
There was just a big White House meeting uh, about future of vaccines, um, and particularly things like IgA-mediated vaccines, ones that help to reduce the overall spread, so your nose not having as much virus in there. Because right now, these vaccines were really tested against hospitalization and death. But we care about more than hospitalization and death. I mean, I really care about hospitalization and death, but it's also like a major bummer to be sick, or it's a major bummer to be in your room for nine days and then have chronic phlebitis afterwards or have chronic memory loss afterwards. And so what ways can we really get to more of a, what we call sterilizing, a, a, a vaccine that really helps prevent infection, not just hospitalization and death, and what do we need to do to come there? So I think that that's technology that we're not at yet, um, but I do suspect that we'll see a bivalent, kind of like we see the flu, with kind of different, um, different variants in the same one available, hopefully this September. Um, and then we'll see from there. Yeah, good question. One last question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going back to some of your information in the rural areas of Alaska, especially, and considering your background, what do you view as how backcountry medicine versus rural medicine versus urban medicine, how do you see that intermixing? In Alaska. Yeah, it's a great question. How do I see backcountry medicine, rural medicine, urban medicine, you know, given my background? You know, um, I think that the, the nice thing about austere medicine and, and backcountry medicine is, again, it's about that person and it's about being creative in that moment. <laughs> like, I don't have a splint, what do I have around me? You know, like when I go hiking or I'm out in the woods, I carry duct tape and an EpiPen. I, those, like, I'm like, that is my full first aid kit. I can't really come up with anything else that I would totally need for the minute. Some of my friends have a really big first aid kit. I'm like, I can kind of improvise most of it. So I think that there is a sense of being able to improvise, being able to figure things out that comes in with backcountry medicine that I think we also see in rural medicine. I mean, you see amazing care happening in rural communities around here. I mean, the work that the community health aides do and the behavioral health aides do, I mean, we have some communities that are 100% vaccinated and for like two years never had a single case. I mean, they just like, Every, they knew every single person, they are able to answer every single question, we're able to do incredible work. We have many communities that, you know, not able to get a plane in and out for sometimes days and able to do incredibly supportive care uh, there when someone has a baby 10 weeks early or a plane crashes or whatever that looks like. So I think that there's a lot of similarities between there. I think that as you get more urban, you have to have more structure. It just becomes hard, just like the traffic lights, right? Like it just everyone starts to run into each other if you don't have a little bit more structure. But I think we always need to be keeping asking ourselves, are we really getting the best for the people that we're serving? And I think that's where we can lose that in urban medicine. And I think you can lose that kind of sense of that person and that place where we have to move backwards. And I think in really rural and austere medicine, you can be really far away from the data, from the science and some of the resources to get the best care possible. So how do we get the science and the resources out to the rural areas? And how do we get the urban areas to really be thinking back to the patient and being able to think about that connection, the social components, what's the role of the family? How do we think about the environment that they live in? So they're just kind of two different streams of either one. Uh, and I think that that rural austere has that advantage of the environment is not a question. Like it's a must that you must take into account versus urban medicine, um, the, the access to those resources, the access to the science and data is different. So like within the state, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can educate and to provide places for a Q&A for our clinicians in really remote and rural areas so they've got access to resources, they've got access to education. And then how do we in our most urban areas think about the system as a whole and make sure that Anchorage isn't so full that they can't accept patients from Fairbanks or Ufiavik or Unalaska and how can they discharge them back? Like during the Delta wave, you know, we did a lot of um, taking of patients in urban areas and sending them back to rural areas when they no longer needed such acute care so that we can make beds and availability in our highest level of care and vice versa. And really we're able to what we call load level to be able to separate it out um, versus kind of the system is just designed to just push people one direction and not both directions. So how do we think bi-directionally about that? So Providence isn't just thinking about Providence. Alaska Regional isn't just thinking about Alaska Regional, but they're thinking about themselves in this larger system of serving all of Alaskans as a whole. So. Um, I appreciate that question because I think it's a, it's a large continuum um, that needs to be that. The only last thing I'll add about that, I used to teach a lecture on avalanche prediction and the emergency medicine and the similarities. And the thing I would say about that is like we all have subjective and objective risks. And I think in medicine, we think a lot about the objective risks. You know, what is their heart disease? What does their EKG look like? But we don't think about those subjective things. What does that patient want? How tired are they? How tired am I as a clinician? What is my team right now? So not just looking at my staffing, but also looking at their morale. How do I think about both of the subjective and objective risks that we have to mitigate avalanche is the same thing that we need to be thinking about in healthcare. Um, and I don't think we've done a great job in healthcare thinking about both of those things. So.
Thanks for the question. Sorry, I can answer for a long time. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thanks. Thank you.